Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we'll read from verse 7 to verse 11, page 812 in your pew Bible. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 7. Let us hear the word of God. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Amen. Let's pray. And now, our Father in heaven, we ask good things of you, the greatest thing that you will feed us with your word, and then momentarily with the supper, that you will minister unto us, that the Spirit will work richly in our hearts. Lord, without you we can do nothing. That is, our heart's confession and our reliance upon you is complete and utter, and so we desire that you will work, that you will sow these words into our hearts, and they may bear fruit even 100-fold, that our faith might grow, we might know Christ more, but ultimately that you, our triune God, will be glorified in the way we live. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, it's certainly true that the Sermon on the Mount is not the easiest passage of Scripture to read. As a Christian, often it's very challenging, uh, probing our sins and our weaknesses. Often what we read and what is preached is hard to hear for all of us. And yet we ought not to shrink back from that, because uh, when the Word speaks to us in such a manner, it is uncovering in us that which God would reveal in our lives, so that we might know it, we might hate that sin, and we might put that sin uh, to death. In fact, that's a great grace in our lives when God reveals where we are wrong and shows us in his word what we are to believe and how we are to conduct ourselves. So we see our failings many times over, I think, in the sermon, uh, perhaps chiefly when our Lord says this in chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfection, righteousness is the standard. We are to be as our Father in heaven is, and that is absolutely righteous. Not gradations of righteousness, but absolutely so. Who can attain to this standard? Which one of us, of our own right and of our own doing, can attain to that kind of righteousness? And to that matter, we might ask ourselves, who can live in this kingdom? Uh, which one of us, by our own strength, can do what our Lord has called us to do, can think as our Lord has called us to think. And yet here in this section, verses 7 to 11, we have perhaps one of the greatest encouragements of the entire sermon. One of those great, great encouragements for us to call upon the name of the Lord, to cry out to God and ask Him for our needs, including our greatest need. What is our greatest, greatest need? It is to be right before God the righteousness of which this sermon has spoken so much. And not just that righteousness that we receive in Christ through faith by imputation, but also that practical righteousness, how we think and speak and what we do, that is our greatest need. Plus the myriad of other needs that we have in our lives. We are told by Christ, the King of this kingdom, Come and ask, because your Father who is in heaven hears you, and he gives you that which you need, because he is good and will give you good things. 
This passage follows the similar pattern of previous passages in the sermon. There is a principle stated, a principle explained, and a principle applied. And if we were to sum up the principle that is stated is this, pray, then pray, and then pray again. Three times we are told to pray. That is the principle stated. The principle explained is found in verses 8 to 10, where our Lord is going to put prayer in the context of relationships, both that we might ask and that we might receive. There's the explanation. And really the application then is verse 11. God gives to those who ask of him. And so really our Lord is returning now to the subject of prayer. Uh, He spent a long time Uh, teaching about prayer, or at least we took a long time examining it. Now he's saying at the end of this sermon, after he's laid out all the myriad of subjects that the law of God touches, and by that I mean it touches what we do and what we think, our Lord then says, pray. Pray for help, because we need it, and you will receive that help. Look first of all at verse 7, the principle that is stated by our Lord. Our Lord says this in verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Notice then how, how our Lord teaches, not just what he teaches, but how he teaches. Because how he teaches informs us that this subject matter of asking and communing with God is a matter of great importance in the Christian life. How then does he teach us in verses 7 to 11? First of all, he states a principle, and he states it three different ways. Ask, seek, and knock. He's emphasizing the principle. Second, in verses 7 and verse 8, and this is not the outline I'm following, but I'm just showing you how he works, Second, in verses 7 and 8, he gives an assurance that those who uh, ask and seek and knock will find what they are seeking. Third, uh, in verses uh, 9 and 10, he gives two illustrations. And finally, in verse, uh, verse 11, he gives a, a contrast. If you, uh, you as parents, you as, you as humans, and, and you who are evil... If, if you can give good gifts to your children, how much more then will your Father in heaven give good gifts? You see what our Lord is doing? In almost every line of this teaching, there is emphasis, there is repetition, there is contrast and comparison. He wants us to see that prayer is so very, very important in our lives. Just as we confessed Heidelberg Catechism 117 earlier, listen also to the question that comes before that, Heidelberg 116. The question is this, why do Christians need to pray? And the answer is, because prayer is the most important part of thankfulness God requires of us. Prayer is the most important part of thankfulness God requires of us, and also because God gives His grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking him for them. So we might ask the question then, if prayer is the most important part of thankfulness God requires of us, if Heidelberg is right, why is it so hard for us to pray? Why is prayer persistently the most challenging discipline that the Christian faces? Matthew Henry commenting on this passage says this, this is what the passage teaches us. It teaches us to pray, and to pray often, and to pray with sincerity and seriousness. Pray and pray again. Make conscience of prayer and be constant in it. Make a business of prayer and be earnest in it. Ask as a beggar asks alms. And Calvin writes on the same matter. It is an exhortation to prayer. And as in this exercise of religion, which ought to be our first concern, we are so careless and sluggish. Christ presses the same thing upon us under three forms of expression. 
There is no superfluity of language when he says, ask, seek, knock. But lest the simple doctrine should be unimpressive, he perseveres in order to rouse us from our inactivity. Why are we so inactive in prayer? And I think there are some fairly astonishing truths to the answer of that question. Why are we, as Calvin says, uh, inactive? Why are we sluggish? I think the first answer as to why we are so reluctant to go to prayer very often, not always, but very often, is this. We simply don't trust God. We simply don't trust God. God. And that's evidenced by the fact we attempt to resolve many of the situations or trials that are before us without any reference to our God in prayer. We simply go straight to our own strengths, our own wisdom. How can we fix it? We do so often without prayer. Why? Because we don't trust God. Another reason, I think, we also don't trust God again. We think that prayer is ineffective. We think that prayer is ineffective, that it won't work, that taking time to get down on our knees and and petition our Father in heaven, we simply don't trust that that's an effective form of resolving whatever troubles us. We go again to our own strengths. We don't trust God's word when he tells us to pray. We don't trust the method of prayer. And lastly, if Heidelberg 116 is to be believed that prayer is the most important part of thankfulness, could it be that we are just a touch or a lot unthankful in our lives? But the good news is Jesus would not have it so. He would not have us thankless. He would not have us distrusting the word He would not have us distrusting the means prayer itself because he reveals here to us, to us as Christians, his brothers, the greatest encouragement, I think, of the entire sermon. So great is the problem, we need a great encouragement. So repeated is the problem, we need a repeated lesson. Ask, seek, and knock. And I want to say to you tonight, if you struggle with prayer, and I suspect most of us do at times, or perhaps even regularly, if you struggle with prayer and your prayer life, the first thing I want to tell you to do is to pray. Is to pray. And pray these words, Lord, make me a prayer. Make me someone who is zealous to call upon your name. Ask and it will be given to you, says the Lord Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you individually believe those words? Ask and it will be given to you. You see, all people are prayers by creation. None are prayers by nature. But Christian Christians must be prayers by grace. By creation, we are all made to commune, but by the fall, by nature, in sin, none call upon the name of the Lord, but we are under grace. We've had grace uh, enter into our lives and wash over us and make us new creations. You see, prayer is that which we come to God with. We commune with our Father in heaven. We commune actually with the triune God in prayer. What a delight it is to commune with our Father in heaven. You see, prayer at first is hard, yet as you do it a bit more, it becomes slightly easier. And as you practice it, and as you discipline yourself, and as you simply do it, it becomes easier and easier until it becomes a habit and a delight. That's what our Lord is saying to us tonight. He's promising us. You struggle with prayer, ask the Lord to help you with prayer. You might ask him for many other things, but your greatest need is to be actually someone who prays. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And I think one of the most fortifying things in this text is the context in which our Lord is speaking. It's the context of grace. Yes, he's been dealing with hypocrites. 
Yes, he's been speaking to those who have externalized the law and loved the praise of men. But here he says this, how much more will your Father who is in heaven? It's as if he's reaching out into the crowd that has gathered around his disciples, reaching out to them and piercing their hearts and saying, yes, there's many hypocrites out here, but you, my brothers and sisters, you have a Father in heaven. You have a Father in heaven. The tone of this section of the sermon is really very different to the rest of the sermon. It actually signals the beginning of the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And having said all that he said about the, the difficulty of living righteously, he says, ask. Ask your Father in heaven, and it will be granted unto you. Our King, King Jesus, calls us to pray. King Jesus, who is, Scripture says, our elder brother, who gives us the Spirit, says, pray. And he gives us commands here, ask, seek, knock. Not in the kind of sense of, of do these and live, but, but he's saying to us, this is your very lifeblood, do it. Be what you are. Don't be what you used to be like, be what you are, children of the King. Call upon the name of the Lord. The context is marvelous. The mediator of the covenant between God and man says, in my name, Come and pray to your Father who is in heaven. The one who makes us acceptable to the Father says now to each one of us, pray to the Father. Isn't that wonderful? The eternal spirit through this passage says, I will sanctify you. I will make you men and women of prayer. And the Father says to us through this passage, you pray, I hear, and I'll answer. Oh, what encouragement there is, brethren, to pray. Was there ever motivation like this to call upon the name of the Lord that the Almighty God tells us, Father, Son, and Spirit, pray and I will hear you. Two quotes from Luther, one short, one long. Luther says, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. Not overcoming God's reluctance. Sometimes we can think of the Father as some kind of mean-spirited old man sat on a cloud. And we're trying our best, as it were, to get his attention. No such thoughts. It's not overcoming his reluctance. It's actually overcoming our own reluctance. It lays hold of God's willingness God's love, God's grace, God's wisdom, God's power, His mercy. That's what prayer does. It exposes us to God in all His wonderful attributes. Luther also says, You have here the comforting promise and rich assurance that He attaches to prayer to make it evident that He cares about it and to teach us to think about prayer as something dear and precious before God. Prayer is dear and precious before God. Even if we had no other reason or attraction than this rich and friendly word, it should be enough to prompt us to pray. And he finishes by saying, I shall not even talk about how dear his exhortation is or how sublime his command or how desperate our need. Oh, look what Jesus is saying. Saying, come to the Father, come to the triune God through my work, through my person. And God will hear. That's why he says in this threefold emphatic way of verse 7, ask, seek, and knock. All metaphors for prayerful activity. Ask. We are commanded to ask for that which is needful in our lives. And asking implies a relationship. I've already spoken to that, and I'll speak to it a little bit more in a moment. We're coming to one who has set his eternal love upon us. And we're coming to one who will not remove that eternal love from us. That is to say, we have every reason to come to our Father and ask him, and every reason to expect that he will answer according 
to his own wisdom. In fact, we're coming to a father, are we not? Verse 11. That is to say, we have a right to come to our father. We come as children. We come, as Heidelberg says, we come with humility. We come knowing that God is God and that we are sinners. But we come to our father. And no mere man can claim the grace of God and the fatherhood of God unless God says, I am your father. And he has said that to the Christian. And he encourages us by these words, ask. And that asking is continuous. It's not a one-off time. I've asked once and, well, it's up to God now. And asking is also not just continuous but childlike. Because we confess our great need, do we not? We confess our great need, that we need all that God has. We're to be humble and we're to be continuous. To that he adds the word seek. Ask, seek, he says. Seeking, as one uh, pastor writes or theologian writes, is seeking is asking plus action. Seeking is asking plus action. Some things we ask for are difficult to obtain. And the idea here is of finding something that has been hidden. Uh, Something you have to struggle. That there is some sort of exertion of self to find what is being sought. And it's not improper for us to think this way. Each one of you that's a true Christian knows how difficult the Christian life is. The mortification of your own sin is a lifelong task, quite apart from everything else that's going on around you. We know the daily struggle, don't we? We know the daily struggle, the challenges. And yet our Lord is saying, seek. Seek something that's precious. Seek something that's worthwhile, and it will be given to you. You will find it. Seeking implies earnestness. It implies diligence. It implies desire and a steadfastness in searching for it. These are things that we must do. We must be. We can pray that God will sanctify us. And if we never open our Bibles, don't expect to be sanctified. We can pray at times for things that we should be doing ourselves. We can ask God, oh, will God do this for me? Well, actually, no, God's not going to do it for you. You need to do it. I need to do it. You see, there is an activity involved with prayer. We can't simply pray on something and be inactive. You see, we're called to action by prayer. Sometimes we are called, as it were, just to let God be God. The matter is so greatly out of our scope Out of our responsibility, God just has to be God. But sometimes he says, you, we the Christian, we need to do something accompanying this prayer. And he says, knock. And perhaps that has the idea here of a perseverance. You're on the doorstep of of your goal of answered prayer. And he says, knock. Remember Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Our Lord told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Then he speaks about the unjust judge. We ought to pray and not to lose heart. We ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 12, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in hope. Prayer, constant, consistency, persevering. You see, we are pers- to persevere in faith. Because to persevere in faith shows everyone, and in a sense shows God in a Genesis 22 kind of way, that we are serious about the petition itself. That we really desire And we really need that petition to be answered. Our Lord says here, knock and keep knocking. Not that you will awaken God 
by your knocking, but you will reveal your trust in him, his word, and his appointed means. And for what are we to ask? And for what are we to seek? And for what are we to knock? I've already suggested perhaps the chief thing of this sermon is righteousness. The one thing we natively lack which is writ large on every line of this sermon, is a righteousness which, which exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. It is a righteousness of perfection, Matthew 5, 48. We're to call upon the Lord that we might receive that righteousness by faith in Christ. We're to call upon the Lord that others might also know that imputed righteousness. And having received it, what do we do? We then ought to call upon the Lord that he would make us live consistently with that imputed righteousness. That we, God's people, would be upright before God in his eyes. And that we would then live uprightly before men and in the quietness of our own home. The secrecy of our own home. The secrecy of our own minds. That our thoughts would be upright. You see, the sermon has called us to banish falsehood and hypocrisy and man-pleasing. The sermon has called us to deal with our heart. It calls us to cleanse the inner man. No matter how polished the outer man may be, we're called to cleanse the inner man. You're thinking, well, how on earth can I do that? Quite right. That's why you're to pray. That's why you're to ask and to seek, and to knock. And let's not forget when this sermon is being given, it's on the cusp of the new covenant being inaugurated. The new covenant is an era which far outshines the glories and the fullness of the old covenant. As amazing as that was, we're in the new covenant era where where Christ himself, who is telling us to ask, has poured out his Spirit upon us, filled us with the Spirit so that we can call on the name of the Lord. Listen to the description of the new covenant era in Joel chapter 3, verse 18. And in that day, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Oh, blessing upon blessing. Abundance of blessing. We've received grace upon grace in Christ. Fullness and truth in Christ. That's what we have. That's what we have. And it's against that background that our Lord is telling us, ask. Ask then for great things. Ask for things that you know by your own strength you cannot attain. We're called by the context of of, of what our Lord is saying here in Matthew to think about the new covenant era in Christ in all his fullness and to call upon God's name for that fullness. Ask, seek, and knock. That's the principle stated. Pray, pray, and then pray again. More briefly, because I wanted to spend most of our time tonight on that principle. More briefly then, secondly, our Lord expands and explains that principle, verses 8 to 10. For some, prayer is an insurance policy. I think I've mentioned two old friends of mine. One who told me that he went to church at Christmas and Easter, and he told me as an insurance policy. And another one, one of the worst blaspheming people I've ever met in my life. Took the Lord's name in vain like you wouldn't imagine. And then her newborn daughter became very sick and hospitalized, and she called on the name of the Lord. You see, for some it's an insurance policy, for others it's a crisis, a momentary acknowledgement of the God who they daily deny and curse with their heart and with their lips. That's not the context of this prayer. That's not the context of the Christian praying either. There's something far, far deeper here 
than those who momentarily, in times of need, call upon the Lord. Christ assures us in two ways that the prayers of the Christian will be heard. The assurance of verse 7 is repeated in verse 8. Did you notice that? Verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And then there's an explanation for everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Christ says twice, ask and it will be given to you. Do you see what he's done? He's emphasized answered prayer. He's emphasized the need to ask, to seek and to find. And twice he has said, you will receive. Do you see that, brethren? It's very important that you do. Our Lord has repeated himself. Ask and it will be given to you, for everyone who asks receives. Oh, so very, very important. Why has our Lord repeated himself? Well, because often our faith fails in such matters. Not, in, not only in those times of trial, the heat of battle, if you want to call it, but we often simply lose sight of the greatness of God and the scope of His goodness and His promise. I don't know about you, but I can simply be forgetful. Which probably means I haven't trained my heart well enough in the first place to remember, but I'm simply forgetful. How often do I fail, do you fail to beseech God on even small, apparently insignificant matters? But God would assure us tonight. Six times in two verses, He tells you, call upon my name, and six times He tells you, I will answer. Now we know He answers in a certain way according to His will, which is always righteous and just and good. And he doesn't always give us what we exactly want, but he always gives us what we need. And why does he do that? Because the Christian has an intimate connection with the Father in heaven. You, dear Christian, have an intimate connection with your Father in heaven. And the first connector is Jesus Christ himself, the eternal Son made flesh, to whom the Christian has been united by faith. How is that for a connection? And the second connection is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit given to indwell you. That's how close your connection is with the Father in heaven. We have, therefore, an unbreakable, intimate, familial connection with our Father in heaven. And that's manifested in the teaching of verse 9 and 10, setting up a comparison or a contrast in verse 11. It speaks first of human relations. Two examples. Which one of you, verse 9, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? And then a second example, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. Which parent that is worth their salt would not delight to give good gifts to their children? The truth is, most of us would move mountains to help our own children and for their own good. We don't turn them away when they come to us in need. We might turn them away when they come to us with wants, which aren't needs, yes, as the Lord does with us. But we wouldn't dream of giving a stone instead of bread to our children. The idea is preposterous. We wouldn't dream of doing it. Where that behavior exists, there is just a shell of a family unit or no family relationship at all. And that's in human activity. Our Lord then applies the principle, verse 11, comparing us to God. Notice he says then in verse 11, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more 
will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Verse 11 is really the crowning glory of the passage. Because what's stated in verses 7 and verse 8, the threefold answer of verse 7, the threefold answer of verse 8, is then explicitly stated, who is the one who gives to us and answers our prayer? It is our Father in heaven. But our Lord has set up a narrative, a comparison. Human relations, human families, you give good gifts. You wouldn't dream of giving the kind of gifts our Lord has spoken of here. Stones and serpents and the like. Notice what our Lord says in verse 11a though. His diagnosis of these people. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts. In what sense are the people he's speaking to evil? I don't think he's speaking to the hypocrites here. I've said that. I think he's speaking to those who are genuine Christians. And yet he goes on to say about them, Ask of your Father who is in heaven. Well, those who are still lost and dead in sin, who are evil, can't have God as their Father in heaven. That's an impossibility. I think our Lord means you who by nature innately, innately are evil. We have to acknowledge that truth. Our Lord here, I think, is speaking in a roundabout way about the, the depravity of the fallen condition. And we have to reflect on that fact, do we not, those of us who are parents, that sometimes we don't always give our children what is good. And we haven't always given them what is good. Why? Because we're not God. And that indwelling sin within us doesn't always yield righteousness, even with our own kin. You see, that's where the great contrast of this passage and the great assurance is for the Christian, for the one who has a Father in heaven. There is a contrast between us and Almighty God. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? That's why we might come with confidence in prayer. That's why we might come with confidence in our prayer lives. He is our loving Heavenly Father. And he has never failed us. And he gives good gifts out of his love to those whom he loves. By his almighty power, he gives us what we need, does he not? And nothing too big can we ask of him. By his wisdom, he gives us what we need, not what we desire. Even, uh, e even the, the good with the bad. Even that which is hard. He gives us by his great wisdom what we need in that moment. By his goodness, he gives us only what is good. Even though it might hurt for a time, we have an absolute assurance because God is good and he only does what is good, that out of his goodness he will give us what also is good. Will not your Father in heaven give good? good things to those who ask of him and by his mercy by his mercy he gives us all things nothing you have nothing you own nothing you are your skills your character your abilities nothing you have is your own and you don't own it by right and if you think you do, get rid of that notion right away because you're skating on thin ice. And you know what happens when you idolize something, especially about yourself? Frequently it can be taken away. No, he gives us all things out of his mercy, his power, his love, his wisdom, his goodness, his mercy. These are the things by which he gives us good things. And because it's by his mercy... Nothing we have we deserve. Is that not a cause for great thankfulness? As Heidelberg 116 said earlier, 
Prayer is the most important part of thankfulness God requires of us. Do you see what our Lord is saying? He's saying as you reflect back on this, this sermon itself, are you someone who struggles with those beatitudinal graces? The poverty of spirit, the meekness, and so on. Are you someone who struggles to exhibit one or more or all of those issues and graces? Our Lord says, pray for them. And keep praying for them and expect an answer. Perhaps you struggle to be salt and light in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. Perhaps you fitted in just a bit too much with those around you who are of the world and you've compromised your witness, our Lord says pray over that issue. Perhaps you struggle with the list of subjects our Lord has dealt with in this passage. You struggle with anger, lust in your marriage, with truth-telling, with retaliation, with love for your enemies. Our Lord says pray over each of those things. Perhaps you struggle with reputational issues. You want people to think well of you. You want the glory that comes from men. Pray for humility. And pray that you'll prefer the glory that comes from God more than that comes from men. Perhaps you struggle with prayer. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray over prayer. Pray that you will become a prayer. Perhaps you struggle with worldly mindedness. Perhaps you struggle with anxiety. Verse 25. Perhaps you struggle with being judgmental. Pray over it and keep praying. And listen to the grand assurance and the marvelous encouragement that our Lord says to us. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Let's pray. How we ask, Almighty God. Indeed, we ask and ask again that your Spirit will take these words and seal them upon our hearts for good, that we, your children, might live well before you, might be found righteous in your sight and righteous before men, that we might trust you and love you. Oh, show us the way, Lord God, the way of prayer, how we cry out to you for this matter. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.